Hello YouTube and welcome back to Be A Loser. Well, as you know from my last video, I've been pretty overwhelmed with the subscriber base that we've gained, as well as all the questions and comments that I've gotten. So I thought I'd make a video outside of our other series to cover a few things that I know a lot of people have questions about. I'm also adding some links at the end of this video to give you more information about which videos need translations and how to add them. Now, no one has to do all the translations of any one video. Any little bit that you can do will help. But without further ado, let's discuss vitamin supplements, gluten-free diets, and the buckwheat diet, what I like to call the good, the bad, and the deadly. common question among those who are trying intermittent fasting or low-carb diets, especially ketogenic diets, is whether or not to take vitamin supplements. Well, Dr. Fung does recommend a multivitamin for longer fasts, those over, say, 36 hours, and especially for those lasting several days. However, there's very little evidence that any vitamin supplement is actually useful, and in some cases, is actually harmful. And the popularity of different vitamin supplements has come and gone. In the late 1960s, the most popular vitamin was vitamin C, and made so by two-time Nobel-winning scientist Linus Pauling. He firmly believed that any modern nutritional problem could be solved by taking high doses of vitamin C, even going so far as to say 75% of all cancer can be prevented and cured by vitamin C alone. Is it any wonder that many people still to this day take vitamin C supplements religiously? Well, over the next few decades, multiple studies disproved most of these claims. As it turns out, the only thing that vitamin C has been shown to definitively cure is scurvy. So unless your name is Jack Sparrow... There should be a captain in there somewhere. Oh, right. Okay, so unless you're Captain Jack Sparrow, vitamin C isn't of much use to you. So, since the great hope of vitamin C was dashed, scientists turned to vitamin E as their next curative supplement. It was believed that vitamin E had benefits as an antioxidant, meaning it would neutralize free radicals that cause oxidative damage to our vascular systems. People were told that taking vitamin E would help prevent heart disease. But, sadly, it didn't. The HOPE trial had as a secondary test the determination of whether or not vitamin E could prevent disease. Unfortunately, the results showed that it didn't. And in fact, those in the vitamin E supplement group had a higher death rate. So vitamin C and vitamin E were out. So next on the list was vitamin B. In the early 2000s, doctors were interested in a blood test to check homocysteine levels. High levels of homocysteine were correlated with increased risk of heart disease. It was also known that vitamin B could lower these homocysteine levels, but whether or not this would prevent heart disease was unknown. The Norvid trial, published in 2006 in the New England Journal of Medicine, compared the results of those in the placebo, or sugar pill group, versus those in the folate supplementation group, meaning those taking vitamins B6 and B12. It was shown that the vitamin supplementation group was dying from more heart attacks and strokes. That's simply not good. And yet, it would get worse. Another study in 2009, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, determined that those undergoing vitamin B supplementation were not only dying of more cardiovascular disease, but were at an increased risk of developing cancer. And not a small increase either. No, a 21% increase in the risk of cancer from vitamin B supplements. And the punches kept coming. It was believed that vitamin B supplementation could be used to fight kidney disease. The Divine study, also published in the JAMA, divided patients suffering from CKD, chronic kidney disease, into two groups, those taking placebos and those taking vitamin B supplements. The purpose of this once more goes back to homocysteine levels. 
These levels are elevated in those with CKD, and the vitamins were successful in lowering the levels. Unfortunately, they caused the kidney disease to become far worse. In fact, it doubled the incidence of negative outcomes. So as we can see, vitamin B supplements are definitely not helpful, and in reality, very possibly deadly. And unfortunately, just stopping taking supplements isn't enough. Enriched wheat flour is wheat that has had all its beneficial parts removed and replaced with certain vitamins, mostly large doses of iron and, you guessed it, vitamin B. This was done because people were very concerned about some nutrient deficiencies, such as iron deficiency anemia. But thanks to all this research over the past several decades, we now know that vitamin B supplementation is actually quite bad for us. But why? Some of you, my wife included, might be thinking, now, hold on a sec. I took folate supplements in my prenatal vitamins. And that's true. B vitamin supplements do reduce the incidence of neural tube defects during pregnancy. But the difference between positive and very, very negative results is a matter of timing. Vitamin B is needed for cellular growth. So during growth periods, such as pregnancy and adolescence, it's good. But during adulthood, it's not good. We do not want increased amounts of cellular growth during this time. The fastest growing cells in the body are cancer cells, and they're bolstered by the increased levels of vitamin B. Additionally, regular cells are scarred by excessive growth leading to fibrosis. This in turn is what causes increased incidence of CVD and CKD. So vitamin C, E, and B are all shown to be useless and in some cases harmful. So calcium was up next. Most doctors recommend calcium supplements for the prevention of osteoporosis. The thinking behind this is that bones are made of calcium. So ingesting calcium should strengthen bones. Seems pretty reasonable unless you do the say it out loud test, right? Eating calcium makes my bones stronger. Eating brains makes me smarter. Eating kidneys makes my kidneys work better. Eating heart cures heart disease. Well, no, but this is the logic that has led us to take calcium supplements for more than half a century. But as we can see from my weight loss and LCHF series, we don't really live in a world of evidence-based medicine. However, there was a trial in 2006 published in the NEJM about calcium supplementation. The Women's Health Initiative put 26,000 women into two groups, placebo group and calcium plus vitamin D group. The study followed the women for seven years and monitored them for hip fractures. And of course, the non-evidence-based reasoning would tell us that the vitamin group suffered fewer fractures because their bones were so much stronger. But the evidence of the trial showed the truth. The vitamin supplement group had the same amount of fractures as the placebo group. The calcium supplements were useless. Well, worse than useless. The patients in the calcium group suffered far more kidney stones. A wonderful parting gift after their seven year study. But why are the vitamin supplements so harmful instead of beneficial? Because once more, doctors are overlooking the root cause of disease. None of these ailments, be it obesity, T2D, CVD, CKD, cancer, osteoporosis, none of them are vitamin deficiency diseases. If they're not caused by lack of vitamins, then why would we ever suppose that vitamin supplementation would cure them? Of course, if you do have a vitamin deficiency, then you should treat it with vitamin supplements. But if you're ailing from something other than vitamin deficiency, then you shouldn't treat it with supplements, as you will not gain any benefit and may actually do harm. It's kind of like having your car not start because the battery is dead. Someone says, hey, you know, one time my car didn't start because it was out of gas. So you think adding more gas will make your car start. 
Obviously, adding more gas to a car with a dead battery isn't going to do any good. But there is, of course, money to be made by selling you supplements to lose weight. However, the true answer is not what can you take or eat to lose weight, but what can you not take or eat to lose weight. And that's where my fasting series can help. So feel free to check it out. All right, now let's move on to two popular diets. The first is gluten-free. Of course, for anyone diagnosed with gluten sensitivity or celiac disease, you pretty well have no choice. But many people who are not diagnosed with these are going gluten-free. There really isn't much evidence that removing gluten, which is a type of protein found in wheat, rye, and barley, does much for long-term health. Nearly 200,000 participants involved in three studies, the Nurses' Health Study, NHS, Nurses' Health Study 2, NHS 2, and the Health Professionals' Follow-Up Study, HPFS, from 1984 to 1990 and 2010 to 2013, and studied food consumption every two to four years. The average gluten intake in grams was 5.8 grams per day for an HS, 6.8 grams per day for an HS2, and 7.1 grams per day for HPFS. The major dietary sources were from pasta, cereal, pizza, muffins, pretzels, and bread. Over the course of this study, there were 15,947 confirmed cases of T2D. The participants who had a higher intake of gluten, around 12 grams per day, had lower type 2 diabetes risk over the course of 30 years. In fact, for the highest percent of gluten consumption, those individuals had a 13% decreased risk of T2D. This is due to the reduction in fiber that is associated with eating less gluten. As we know from the LCHF series, fiber has a very, very important role in protecting us from the negative effects of refined carbohydrates. So if you're trying to lose weight or gain health benefits by eating gluten-free and have not been diagnosed with the aforementioned disorders, then you are in reality increasing your risk of weight gain and T2D. So instead of gluten-free, remember to eat natural, whole foods, especially those that are carbohydrates. And finally, the buckwheat diet. Studies have shown that buckwheat extract fed to rats suffering from type 1 diabetes before a meal was successful in reducing blood sugar levels by 12 to 19 percent versus, versus those fed placebos. This is obviously highly beneficial in individuals with type 1 diabetes. Will it aid those with T2D? Well, as we know, it's insulin and insulin resistance that are the issue with T2D and that high blood sugar is a symptom of this. Lowering the blood sugar response to foods with a fiber, such as buckwheat, is certainly helpful, but not really a cure. We know from my fasting and LCHF series that either not putting garbage in, LCHF, or getting the garbage out, IF, or both, is the true answer here. So if you want to supplement your LCHF diet with whole, natural, unprocessed buckwheat fiber, that may get you some positive results. But short of that, I wouldn't recommend using it as a superfood. Remember that the really important question is when to eat, then followed by the question of what to eat. And if the answer to that question is LCHF, then you're on the right track. So hopefully this video has answered some common questions for you, as well as shedding light on some mainstream dietary ideas that simply aren't particularly helpful, and in some cases, flat out dangerous. Please keep your questions coming, as well as suggestions for future videos. I will occasionally make these standalone videos to try and answer the more common questions. I'll be continuing my current series as well and try my best to get those videos out at least every two weeks. Life's gotten pretty interesting for me and I'm still trying to get my recording schedule organized. So if this is your first time visiting the channel, please subscribe and enable alerts to be updated to new videos. Also, if you found this video helpful, please consider clicking the like button. As always, thanks so much for watching. And until next time, keep being a loser.